Thank you very much, Jawad. Thank you for that introduction. And um, thank you very much, Ian, for introducing so many of these topics very, very well. Um, Jawad, if we'd cracked that problem of scaled agile, I'd probably be have, having a slightly different talk. Um, what I want to do is to tell you some stories about where we are at Emerald now and to tell you a little bit about what's been happening in the past three years. Um, most people here know quite a bit about Emerald, I imagine. Um, we're, um, we're just having a conversation, David and I, about whether we were officially north of the wall in publishing terms. We're just north of, Bing, uh, just north of Bradford in Bingley. And for the last 51 years, we've been making um, uh, business and management scholarly content. Um, we're a proud family business, strong connections to the local community, most recently um, seen in our partnership with Headingley Stadium. One consistent theme for Emerald has been about how to ensure that we've got real impact from our publishing, and we're approaching this from the perspective of applied research, which, which is one of the reasons why quite a lot of our current output concerns um, uh, topics related to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, for example. As I said, I'm going to talk to you about our Agile journey. Um, I've only been at Emerald for a year, so I'm going to make some stuff up about the past three years, and then I'm going to focus quite deeply on the past three months. And uh, the first section is called From Sofas, Sofas and Surfaces. Now, I don't think there's anybody else from Emerald here, so um, you won't know how much I'm kind of paraphrasing. Um, I, think, I think the first thing I'm going to do, though, is just jump back in history a little bit. So um, back in the 1980s, um, our owner, Dr. Keith Howard, was the editor of the International Journal of Operations and Production Management. Um, and this journal published in 1984 an article on the Toyota production system that Ian mentioned. Uh, and this was an article that was talking about Kanban techniques. It's a good example of what Emerald means by real impact. Um, obviously, that's had a significant impact on the wider world. And it has featured quite heavily in terms of Emerald's uh, workflows and techniques. So I'm going to go forward 30 years or so to 2016. What was happening around then? Some fairly predictable challenges, really. Um, an increasingly global uh, team, offices around the world, um, acquisitions making the business more fragmented, um, and a need for some real innovation. Uh, a need also to scale our output um, and, crucially, to have much more uh, transparency over progress um, towards that scale, but also progress in how we were improving. So those were some of the problems that we were trying to solve. Um, and uh, the next slide is going to show you quite, quite crudely and simply how we approach that um, through the medium of photographs. So. Um, these are some pictures I took in the past couple of weeks, but they're broadly representative of some of the things that have been going on for the past three years. And they're in kind of two different areas. Uh, the first is about the physical um, and the technical infrastructure. And um, over here on the right, that's where the sofas come in. Um, what we've tried to do is create a really engaging workspace where people can come together and collaborate, where they can bump into each other and have conversations, go and sit down and work on problems. Um, we've also done a lot of work on the um, technology that people are using for their work. Uh, until about three years ago, most people were using desktop machines. Um, around about that time, everybody got uh, provided with a laptop or a lightweight device. And we rolled out uh, things like Office 365 and Skype for Business so people can collaborate more effectively from different locations. Um, and then the second category of things that we did was just essentially pick some quite key lean techniques and try and apply them in different circumstances. So in the center of the screen there, you've got your ubiquitous Kanban. Can't see that too well, but it's actually a recruitment Kanban just showing how roles are going through the different stages of the hiring process. And then in the production area, in content management, we did things like uh, problem solving through 5S, um, or more simplistically in the editorial team, what are the problems with the process? What bugs are we experiencing within the editorial process? Stick them up on the wall, and people come together and try and solve those problems. And then finally, the idea of the, the information radiator. So the, the screen up there 
uh, maybe even a white, whiteboard or a flip chart just showing where we are in terms of our publishing process. So that is quite crude and a lot of hard work went to, into it. Um, I'm going to tell you what came from that. Um, well, obviously there was an outbreak of post-it notes around the business, um, but some other things happened as well. Uh, we were able to produce um, various new product propositions, um, bringing case study formats to market, putting out our first um, open access proposition. The photograph there, the snowy, the snowy picture, that was taken by our chief executive, Vicky Williams, during the Beast from the East. And the Beast from the East happened to um, sweep in uh, the day after our sales teams came from all around the world for a sales conference. So what that conference actually ended up looking like is a load of salespeople holed up in a hotel, unable to go to the office, office unable to open, lots of staff all around West Yorkshire just sitting there in their spare room, conferencing in <laughs> to people from all around the world. So not the best conference, but the technology was able to support that kind of flexibility. In the um, content management area, the situation was a lot more complicated. Um, some of you may know um, Janine burr willens I'm going to talk a little bit about some of her work in this area. And I think if you're interested, I can connect you with her because she can talk about it much better than I can. But what she found was that um, some of the kind of cookie cutter agile that was being promoted didn't work very well for uh, content management. If you're producing 13,000 journal articles a year, trying to map those all on post-it notes doesn't work very well. Um, there was a big challenge around book publishing because there was a need to massively increase output but also support much greater flexibility of format. Um, what we would normally do is think about that quite hard, um, define a workflow, specify that, get somebody to build it, and then we just churn things out. That just wasn't going to be good enough anymore because it needed to be much fresher, more interesting, more diverse. So what she did was just say, I'm not going to do that again. What I will do is just pick on some key techniques like having a whiteboard and showing what's going on, having a daily stand-up meeting, making sure everybody knows what they need to do and having some of those uh, problem-solving techniques where when there are issues, we just work through them and get them done. So, um, what came from it? In terms of the book publishing, from 2016 till now, Janine and her team have been able to output 60% more books. It's a really, really amazing result because they didn't have any extra staff. It was just through these different techniques. So more books, better books, no extra staff. So that's pretty good, right? Um, are we done as a company? Can, can we stop now? Well, what happens if you optimize one part of the business, but you don't attend to the wider picture? What would happen if you empowered a set of product owners, but you didn't have a mechanism in place for aligning their work streams or for prioritizing between their products? You're going to get some problems, you're going to get some bottlenecks, you're going to get some conflicts. And if you're in the technology team, you're thinking, gosh, how can I make sure that I can do these things? How can I help this person, that person, this person, that person? If you don't have those processes in place, you don't have that protection in terms of process, you're going to slow down. You're going to start trying to do too many things. So you get some kind of horrible task switching. The machine starts to slow down, stakeholders start to get disaffected team starts to get quite demoralized. Has anyone felt like that? <laughs> so we've, we've basically got the, the core chronic, chronic conflict where the business ex expectations of the technology team and what's really going on in the technology team are just miles apart. So no, we're definitely not done here. We need to reinvent our system of work. Um, earlier on, Ian showed uh, some books about Lean. One of them was Lean Enterprise by Jess Humble. Um, so you're probably familiar with the story about uh, the new United Motor Manufacturing Plant, Ian. Yeah, nods. Anybody else know that story? All right. So there's the, there's the plant. That's in Fremont, California. It's the Tesla factory now. In the 1980s, it was General Motors factory. 
Um, around about that time, Toyota wanted a US base of operations, and General Motors wanted to know how to make small cars profitably. So they came together in a joint venture, and they decided to make their cars there, which was a bit surprising because this was one of the worst ever plants from General Motors. People were drunk on the job, lots of gambling was taking place, this kind of petty sabotage going on, um, people putting uh, empty beer bottles into car doors and then selling off down the production line, just crazy stuff. So it was quite surprising that um, Toyota agreed to um, a request from the United Auto Workers Union to hire back the same workers that were at this terrible plant that had been closed because it was so bad. So they hired them back in and they sent them off to Toyota City to learn the Toyota production system. And they came back after their training and within three months they were producing small cars profitably. So it was that system of work that wasn't working. It wasn't the people that were bad, um, although some of that stuff just sounds quite bad. But <laughs> generally it was the system of work that created the bad outcomes. So we decided to take out a leaf out of Toyota's book and um, we did an improvement cutter, which was one of the things that Ian mentioned. You had that diagram with where you are now, where you want to be, and then the wiggly line in between. It's basically a way to solve a problem. You don't quite know what all the steps are along the way. So we did this in the tech team, and we said, that, that square right up there, that's red. That's, that's where you are now. So what's going wrong in your uh, current situation? What's your current condition, and what's, what do you not like about it? So we were in a situation where there was a lack of prioritization of focus. And we had a large team because the team could get like any request. So well, we've got to have all the different people in the team so they can jump on anything. And this lack of focus meant really bad task switching and no slack time to develop skills. Um, really difficult to see what was actually going on with any given piece of work. And then slow delivery. Oops. So that slow delivery got everybody really frustrated. Management was very frustrated. Um, and the developers were really quite demoralized. It's not, it's not life affirming to be in that situation. So that's quite, quite a bad situation. What, what do we do about it? Down there in the green, that's, that's your definition of awesome. That's how you want to be better. And then you've got your blue and your black text. The blue is what's the next target condition that you want to achieve. Um, and then the black is literally what's the first thing you're going to do to take you towards that target condition. So I'll talk a little bit more about some of this now. So first thing we did was look at how the team was organized. As I said, we had a large team because it could be called upon to do anything and it really wasn't effective. So we came up with something more conventional. The um, proverbial two pizza team, smaller team with cross-functional skills. That is a, uh, an artwork from one of our developers <laughs> who, who drew uh, essentially the squad model from Spotify or Sky. Essentially, you've got a cross-functional team. He called them the red, green, and the blue team because we didn't want to get too hung up on what they were called at that point. And you've got all the different roles you need in the team. You've got a horizontal slice of, of skills, uh, and that's your sort of um, functional home base. So you've got all the testers who have a functional home base that we're calling the chapter. And then the sort of blobby bit is um, uh, what, what they call a guild to handle cross-cutting cross concerns. It might be security, performance. It's, it's a common uh, theme that needs to be handled across the development organization. So we set our teams up differently, made them much smaller. We got all the ceremonies for the teams determined. So how are the teams going to um, run their sprints? How are they going to talk to each other, make sure they keep on track? Um, and how are they going to work together, treat each other with respect, turn up on time, try and do pair programming, that kind of thing. But there's one other thing that happened as well, which really was what made this possible. And that was that we, we said, look, we've got enough work in process already. We need to stop. We need to say, this is it. We're going to let the teams focus. So we agreed a project freeze with our board, which was quite a big deal. Um, what we did following that is just some stuff to to make our work more visible. So things like information radiators, showing the progress uh, of the team within a sprint, burn down charts, 
Um, it, was, it was over the summer, but it was clearly quite cold in Bingley that day. So, does anybody know what that is? So, uh, there was reference earlier to um, Eli Goldratt's book, The Goal. This is, this is a starring character in the book, The Goal. Um, it also features in um, Phoenix Project, which kind of rehashes quite a lot of The Goal. Um, it's a heat treat oven. This is where, this is that part of my talk title. What, essentially it's, um, this in the goal was the slowest workstation within the manufacturing plant. It's where all the stock was stacking up because this could only go so fast. So the way to make the plant move more quickly would be to speed this workstation up. What we did was have a look at um, our value streams um, and determine what are our slow workstations that we need to optimise. And that meant that we could do prioritised improvement. So I've just got a couple of examples of what that looked like for us. The first one is about how you turn um, features into stories and then into tasks. I had quite a few problems in this area. Um, it was really challenging to get stories ready for a sprint. We had issues with missing acceptance criteria. It was really difficult to estimate because the stories were quite large um, and um, it resulted in people not really understanding what they were doing, resulting in rework. Um, so what we did about it was really work hard on what do we mean by a story being ready? What do we mean by a story being done? And we said, we can't have a story that's bigger than eight points because anything bigger than that needs to be broken down. Um, and uh, three amigos conversation between product um, testing and development is not just gonna be once a sprint, it's gonna be whenever it needs to be. Um, and uh, that's really improved people's understanding of what we're actually working on and why we're doing it. The second one was how developers and testers work together. Um, we had been working using uh, behavior-driven development format, um, but we had um, a workflow where you had a manual step followed by an automated step, but none of this was going too well because we had too much work in progress. We were taking too much into sprints, um, and it was resulting in a great big bulge of work hitting the test team on you know, the second last day of the sprint, and surprisingly enough, it doesn't get done. Um, so what we've done instead is say, look, we've got to take less work in. It is better to finish work than start work. So we reduce the amount of work we're taking in. We're having um, regular dialogue between product development and tests, so everybody understands what's being done, how it's going to be developed, how it's going to be tested. Um, and when something is uh, ready for demonstration, it's demonstrated. If problems occur, they get fixed straight away, so we don't raise bugs afterwards. We just fix it then and there. Um, and then what often happens towards the end of our sprints now is that actually most people are just testing, regardless of what your role is, developers, testers, product, everybody just swarming to get the work done. So what's come of this? We're only two months in, so this is tentative, um, and uh, there's still a lot to prove, quite frankly. But contrast's not that good, but you can see the green bar, the green bar's going up, gray bar's going down, so taking in less work, we are finishing our work now. This is very significant for us. What we're starting to hear as well is that um, retrospectives are talking about the amount of teamwork that's going on. Um, People are learning new things, so developers are learning our automation test framework, for example. That is a real quote from one of the development team. Seriously, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it when he said it, but it is the first time to him that Agile ever made sense. Uh, the other day, I caught one of the developers with a copy of the Toyota Cata by Mike Rother on his desk. He would bought it with his own money. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> um, and I also overheard a conversation the other day when somebody was talking about Daniel Pink's theory of motivation and how the squad model um, fosters autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Like, wow, this is incredible. I never, I never thought that kind of conversation would occur. So um, it's, it's made a real difference to people's morale and how they feel about their work. So we've got to make this stick now. We've got to figure out how to scale it out, how to stabilize it. 
And this is where the safe part comes in. What we're doing at the moment is trying to determine what are the key elements of the safe, scaled, agile framework that we need to put in place to enable us to make this system of work scale. Um, I've identified three here. The first one is about making sure that the flow from product management into product ownership works effectively. So between that discovery piece that's very um, customer facing down into the team that are writing the user stories and working in detail with the scrum team. That needs to work really well. It needs to work better with architecture as well. What we were finding is a disconnect between product vision and the architecture and between the architecture and the development. So that needs to be addressed um, and we need to have product roadmap and architectural runway um, working uh, well in tandem. And then we need to get better at our operations that underpin all of this so that we can create environments um, and deploy code much more effectively. We've got to come up with a really robust way of managing these three types of, types of work. Um, and this sounds quite basic. Uh, and I should say that Emerald has done lots of different um, iterations of how to um, govern work. But there's always a tension in the culture between um, empowerment and control. And this is something that we, we need to address so that we can get that single funnel of work into the team so the team can create value. And then underneath that, we're working on different um, operational improvements to make sure that everything is done in a, in a smooth um, and sustainable way. In a bit more detail, there's another art artwork from one of our developers. <laughs> this is his vision of how we could manage a portfolio of work. Um, we, we haven't taken his ideas wholesale, but I quite like his um, red shoot down the side of the page, which is emergencies get immediate attention. What we're looking at is how to take um, high-level business goals, which are represented by those hexagons at the top. It might be about business goals, about how to engage customers. It might be about how to um, push out a shared services function around the group. Uh, those um, business goals are going to be flowing into a funnel, which forms a portfolio backlog for teams to work on. If anybody's successfully done this, please speak to me. I'd love to know how you do it, <laughs> how you make it work successfully, and what the challenges were. What I think our challenges are going to be are around maintaining that buy-in. Essentially, just as development and implementation teams have a social contract, I feel like we have a social contract between our staff and our, our business, between technology and the wider company um, to allow uh, this way of working to, to flourish. We need to sort of keep faith that this system of work will deliver at scale and we need a really good way of making that portfolio process work and of enabling us to take in more work so that there is that faith maintained about this way of working. We need to make sure that we can um, reconcile these cultures of empowerment equals good governance equals bad. And I think the way probably to do that is to get everybody to buy into that portfolio management mechanism. But it's easy to say, surely not hard to, uh, surely hard to do. And then uh, finally, we need to make sure that everybody has enough time to learn, to learn technologies, to reflect on how we're working. So maybe I'll be back next year. <laughs> I'll let you know if it worked. <laughs> Thank you. Can we have questions for Alice? Uh, thank you very much. I found that very interesting. I was just kind of wondering if you talked about the, the business goals and the strategy, you know, how that, how that fed into this, and is there a feedback loop from this back into the, the wider business strategy? You know, who's making it? How is it being into so see if I understand your question um, are you talking about whether there's a connection between what we what we're doing in the overall what the business is trying to achieve and what that connection is to make sure that we're on message 
uh, how you're defining that message, I suppose. Is it just from the top down or is, it, is there more coming through the business? To be honest, I think we're just trying to solve some problems. We have too many things going on and we have a team that's feeling really rotten because they can't do everything that everybody wants to do. Um, and so, fortunately, we are able to have a conversation with the execs about those challenges and to try and persuade them that if we're allowed to work in a different way, we'll probably do a bit better. But, you know, I'd like it to be a bit more scientific than that, but it, it kind of wasn't. It was, we've got some problems, let's try and do something sensible about them. I, th I, think, I think the more strategic piece is going to come when we get that portfolio management mechanism in place. That's when they really have to buy into a more controlled process for taking in work. That was a great talk, thank you very much. Um, did, did you implement work in progress limits? And if you did, did you ever have situations where there were like workstations that had Slack? And if they did, how did those people in the situation of having Slack respond? Were they okay with that or were they trying to find work to do because they were feeling a bit edgy about it? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is yes, but it's early. So what we've done is to say, we know our current velocity and we know what we want to be achieving. And on that basis, we can allocate a certain amount of story points per sprint to other types of work. Um, what we have found is that there's not a perfect match between the work requests and the skills in the team to deliver them. And uh, at the moment, there's, there's, a, there's a team that's doing something that's quite back-end heavy and there's a front-end guy in that squad. Um, and there's questions about, well, what should he be doing? One of the things that he's been doing is trying to learn how to use the back end because we'd like to we'd like to broaden his skills base. Um, but the other thing he's been doing is actually just pragmatically taking on some more sort of business as usual tasks that are quite contained but relatively high value. So I think we're we're still trying to feel our way towards that. But yes, we have that concept, and yes, we do have a mismatch between the work requests and the skills. But we are hoping that that's going to enable us to use some of that slack time to, to make people a bit more T-shaped.